we are now just about um, one o'clock. And so it's time for me to introduce today's uh, neuro, COVID neuro webinar. I have to just click a, click a button that says continue. Otherwise, nothing will happen. And welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome. As you can see on the screen, we have today speakers from various places. We have an Angel Miraplin from uh, CMC Valor. Hi, Angel. Hi there. We have uh, Hi. we have Richard Perry from University College London. Hi, Richard. Hello. We have Bethany Facer, who's part of the COVID CNS team and is based in Liverpool, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, in Liverpool. I'm right about that. Great, yeah. thanks. Uh, so this is the Neuro Associations of COVID nineteen webinar. We've had many of these. I, I don't even know how many now, but it's a large number, and um, it's run uh, through the Brain Infections Global Program. Uh, this shows you the website, and you can click on the various tabs there to get access to other things. Um, Brain Infections Global, we have uh, thousands of visitors. This slide is, is slightly outdated from all over the world, and they join us uh, to learn about brain infections and share their experiences. We also have our e-learning courses, which you'll find by one of those drop-down tabs if you want to join those. And the webinars are to bring together the global community working on COVID neuro to better understand neurological disease in COVID-19, keep people up to date with the latest research. And then also immediately after this, on the hour, we have the WHO Clinical Exchange Network, where we discuss some of the particular regional issues. Also, we want to hear from you. Like I said, we've done lots and lots of these COVID neuro webinars. We think... We've got COVID neuro. Well, every time we think we've got it nailed, we discover something new as we'll hear today. But really we want, we want uh, you to answer a survey because we want to know from people uh, whether it's time to wrap the webinars up or whether we should actually transition and discuss other uh, neuro aspects of neurological infections. So should we be morphing into uh, neuro ID webinars over the coming months? So you'll be sent the link and please, please fill it in. Um, uh, you can post your questions and comments today uh, via the chat function on Zoom or via the chat function on Facebook and they'll be translated across. That's my Twitter thing there at Running Mad Prof. So you're in for a real treat today. It's all about thrombosis, venous sinus thrombosis in the brain. Um, Angel is going to give us her experience from Christian Medical College of Law on the virus causing thrombosis. And then, of course, uh, we've all heard about the vaccines causing thrombosis. Richard is going to present some work from the UK and in between those two we have as a little interlude Bethany Facer who's going to do the COVID neuro highlights from the wonderful JNNP blog and then as I mentioned immediately after we'll have the clinical exchange which Tamara Piri is going to chair along with Ben Michael and Gareth Lipungo is going to be presenting a case from Malawi. So our next webinar is on the 16th of November. You'll be getting an invite to that. But without further ado, let us move on. And uh, let me introduce Angel. As I said, she is a, uh, a senior resident at CMC Valor in India, and she's going to present her experiences there. I'll hand over now to Angel. I'll be sharing my screen. Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. So, uh, greetings from Prison Medical College, Velour. So, um, at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Priscilla for having given me this opportunity to uh, give this talk. Um, I'd also extend my gratitude to uh, my professors, Professor Sanjit and uh, Professor Ajit, who is indeed a part of this NeuroCOVID network in Velour. So, the one, Angel, the one thing I might say, if you don't mind me interrupting, is really shout yeah. out a bit louder if you can. That's great. Great. So, I'd, uh, am I audible now? Yeah, that's great. Carry on. Yeah, sure. So, I'll be starting with a case vignette. Uh, this is a 29-year-old lady with headache, right focal seizures, and right hemiparesis. Uh, at admission, she had a temperature recorder of 101, uh, and her uh, GCS was uh, E3, aphasic, and M3. Uh, she had a clinical papilledema, and she had a right hemiparesis. Systemic examination was normal, and uh, she tested positive for COVID. So 
you can see these are her MR images where we can see a large, uh, fairly large T2 hyperintensity, which is involving the temporal extending to the parietal lobe with significant mass effect. This is a DWI sequence, which is actually showing some diffusion restriction with a concomitant ADC map. And we see the SWI sequence is showing blooming, so it's of a bleed. And these are the post-contrast scans, which is actually showing the filling defect here uh, in the superior genital sinuses, as well as bilateral transverse sinuses. So um, what is the risk of having a CVT post-diagnosis of COVID? So this is one large study which is published recently, uh, which included 5,000, 5 lakh, uh, 37,913 COVID-19 cases. And uh, they found the absolute risk was about 42.8 per million people. And the incidence of CVT following the COVID-19 significantly decreased with the time from the index event, which is at the diagnosis uh, post week one and two, you have a high incidence and the incidence drops subsequently. So now talking about this concept of uh, immunothrombosis. So what is unique with this virus, which is causing a huge array of thrombotic as well as neurological uh, manifestations. So explaining the thrombotic uh, manifestations, we have deciphered the pathogenesis to some extent where we know that the S1 subunit of the virus, uh, which is in the spike protein binds to the ACE2 receptors and which facilitates the viral attachment. Subsequently, the S1, S2 region, the region of uh, 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 the S protein, it's cleaved by the proteases, furin, and the uh, 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 other um, uh, serine protease enzymes. And this facilitates the uh, uh, viral attachment as well as entry into the cell. So after the entry, the cell undergoes something called as a pyroptosis, which is a highly inflammatory form of cell death. Uh, and a lot, it's not just the SARS-CoV-2, a um, large number of viruses which are cytopathic cause this type of cell death, which leads to expression of damps, which is the danger associated molecular patterns. This sets up a series of um, problems which you could see here in the endothelium. So this is a normal endothelium. So in fact, it's not just the respiratory route, there is a direct endothelial entry of the viral particles as well could with mediated by the ACE2 receptors uh, have been established. So subsequently what happens, the activated endothelium overexpresses the von Willebrand factor, that is step one. Subsequently, there is a lot of activated uh, activation of the cytokines and the chemokines, which um, lead to recruitment of either the platelets or the neutrophils. So then there's another thing called as the nectosis, which is the neutrophil um, uh, uh, extracellular traps, which are formed, which again activates the contact pathway that again facilitates formation of the clot. And all this put together overexpresses the tissue factor, which is the key, key um, what do I say, the, which is a key of the extrinsic pathway. And again, the clotting cascade gets switched on. So again, this is just the, so that happens at the level of the pulmonary circulation where that's the entry point of the SARS-CoV-2. Whereas when you have the active viremia, the whole sequence continues as your chemokines and your cytokines get potentiated where uh, you have activation of the contact pathway leading to thrombin generation. The activation of the tissue factor overexpression again increases the thrombin generation and the von Willebrand factor overexpression which is fueled by all the cytokines and the chemokines, facilitates the formation of the clot. So summarizing, we have two ways. One is when you have a very severe um, COVID-19 patient where you have a high viral load. So you have very high chemokines, cytokines, which are in the circulation and IL-6, which, which, which actually sets up a procoagulant milieu. So there's thrombosis everywhere, microthrombosis as well as macrothrombosis, as well as your neurotropism of the virus itself, which can actually have increased predilection to reach the brain and in fact cause augmentation of thrombosis in the 
cerebral circulation, which can manifest either as an arterial stroke or a CVT. And there is another mechanism where uh, your there is a uh, increase in angiotensin two enzyme levels, which is actually a pro-inflammatory hormone because of its uh, decreased conversion. So that again activates the cytokines and leads to thrombosis. So a CVT actually a manifestation of severe COVID. So what do we have from data so far, which have been published? So Baldini et al. have published a systematic review and meta-analysis, which includes all the reported cases uh, till Jan 2021. So they included 57 cases, and they found that 92.9% were symptomatic for their COVID-19, with 81% having an abnormal lung imaging, and the 90% of the CVT occurred with or after the symptom onset. And uh, the next large series is from New York, where they looked at 13,500 COVID patients and they found 12 cases, among which 75% uh, were symptomatic and 58% had occurrence of CVT within 24 hours of onset. In fact, this is actually a sicker group where actually 40% required mechanical ventilation for COVID-19 disease. The next uh, study is from a multi-center, multinational cohort, which included 10 centers from four spanning four countries. They uh, reported about 20 cases, 55% of uh, them being symptomatic, with 65% occurrence of CVT as a presenting feature. So answering the question, is CVT actually a manifestation of severe COVID-19? Here we see there are varying results, where one cohort, we actually see 50% of them sick, 50% less sick, there's another cohort where 45% are not symptomatic at all for COVID. So are there any laboratory markers to guide prognosis in these patients? Uh, they had identified three markers. One is fibrinogen, which is abnormal in about 50% of the patients. D-dimer levels were above threshold in all cases which have been reported so far, except two in the last study. Uh, CRP was elevated again in all patients except two. So they could be uh, guided as a prognostic marker. Coming to another interesting concept where they found higher antiphospholipid antibodies in those patients with COVID. So this is another meta-analysis which actually showed that antiphospholipid antibodies were seen in 46.8% of patients uh, in COVID. So is it a causation for thrombosis or is it just a silent bystander? We still do not know. But what we know is it's significantly most uh, described in uh, patients with critically, in critically ill COVID patients as opposed to those who are asymptomatic. So what are the treatment outcomes uh, among those patients with CVT and COVID? Uh, the mortality rates range between 20%, 17.4% to 40%. So, which is quite high. Um, and parenchymal bleed tended to be more frequent in those who do not survive. And low GCS also appears to be a significant predictor. So what are the management principles? The management principles uh, for the CVT with or without COVID appears to be the same. First is a rapid anticoagulation. Treat the underlying cause, which is either sepsis or dehydration. Control the seizures promptly and manage intracranial hypertension. So we go uh, by this flow chart, we confirm with the imaging, initiate subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin. If they respond well, that means they improve clinically, they are heparin responders. So you discharge them on warfarin, or if they, despite being on heparin, you wait for about 48 hours, they continue to deteriorate or progress, worsening seizures, you label them as separate non-responder and we take them up for endovascular treatment, which is mechanical thrombectomy, or you can even do a catheter thrombolysis. If they have mass effect, like brain swelling or worsening intracranial hemorrhage with a midline shift, they're candidates for decompressive brainectomy. So this is a summary of the uh, European Academy of Neurology Guidelines, which has been latest uh, in 2017. So we have a strong recommendation for heparin in the acute phase um, and decompressive surgery to improve outcomes in patients with parenchymal lesions and impending herniation. The other recommendations for uh, raised ICP, anti-epileptics, hydration are all weak, but majority are for than against. 
it's interesting to note that there is no recommendation for endovascular treatment probably less studies which show a favorable outcome but we need to wait so now i'll be taking you through our experience uh, uh, in sars cov2 and cvt so this is our publication in annals of uh, indian academy of neurology uh, where in 8 years our center has one of the highest burdens of uh, cvt uh from 2000 jan to 2017 december we have treated about 1254 cases of cvt um so our burden as it is is very high so we are a 3000 bed quaternary care center in south india and uh, the study on cvt and covid is an observational study and we obtained the data from the prospectively maintained database we included patients with confirmed rt pcr uh, for sars cov2 with cvt and the outcomes we looked at were the mortality um, and a good functional outcome which we defined as a disability score which is the mrs score uh, of less than 2 so this is uh, data from the indian government ministry of health and family welfare summarizing our two waves which uh, passed by the first wave uh, which started somewhere in uh, late march peaked um during the late october september and october time so at that point of time we had a recorded about 1.5 lakh cases per day uh the second wave was um devastating where we had uh, the peak which went up by april may where we recorded more than 4 lakh cases a day so this is our uh, weekly case records in our emergency department um uh, spanning correlating with the indian government data where we had the first peak where we had about 1000 patients that was sometime in september 2020 as opposed to may when we had like 2000 patients um uh, presenting to ed so from 2018 till date so 2018 we had 134 cases of cvt 2019 we had about 80 cases and during the pandemic period spanning 2020 2021 we had 154 cases uh because as a, as it is a high burden center i would not call this a significant rise um and wave 1 is about 52 cases we had seen and during the wave 2 we had seen 45 cases but interestingly the covid positive cvts were only 11 so coming to these 11 patients we see about all of them i mean the mean age was about 35 so they young equal sex predilection and coexisting medical conditions they actually saw um, hypertension diabetes and hiv infection in one patient uh, none of them had ocp use or malignancy which could have again predisposed to cvt two patients were postpartum um, uh, patients maybe they could have had some dehydration or even pregnancy itself seems to be a risk factor but um but only 2 out of 11 were in the postpartum period so again interesting to note that fever was seen in about 45% of patients and only one patient had the typical ili symptom in the form of cough breathlessness or uh, any other systemic symptom pertaining to covid 100% of them presented with headache 90% of them with seizures and 72% had focal deficits and 90% of them had only mild covid illness only one patient had a uh, severe illness with ards requiring ventilation so the gcs at admission the mean gcs was about 11 the range between 8 to 15 and it's interesting to know that uh, cvt as the index presentation was seen in about 80% of patients so in fact they are very mild symptoms in fact asymptomatic but cvt being the index presentation of covid was seen in about 9 out of 11 patients which is striking in our cohort um we see the mean hemoglobin was 12.4 we know the anemia will predispose to cvt so uh, that appears to be okay and the mean crp appears to be elevated again as described in the previous cohorts the mean d dimers also on the higher side and it, we also had about 27 patients who had anticardiolipin antibody positivity which is again described in the previous co- cohorts but again as i said causation or a silent bystander we do not know at this moment so coming to the sinus involvement we see almost 90% of them had transverse sinus involvement and 63% had vena flabby thrombosis 
sigmoid sinus was about 70% again, and superior sagittal sinus was about 63%. So deep venous system, deep venous sinus involvement is very less, about 18% only had. And 77% of them presented with a hemorrhagic infarct. And uh, I'm sorry, 81% of them had hemorrhagic infarct. Among them, 77% uh, the hemorrhagic infarct was localized to the temporal lobe as opposed to the other lobes. And two patients required decompressive hemicranectomy. And these are our outcomes. So at admission, we see the disability scores are quite high. So almost about 75% of them are in the higher MRS of four and five, which is dependent for all ADLs. At discharge, we see the same 72% have come down to MRS one, which is independent for all activities of daily living. There were two patients who are still in MRS four at discharge, but those are the two patients who require the decompressive hemicranectomy. Their three month follow-up is awaited. So concluding, 80% of patients had only symptoms and signs of CVT as index presentation. Hence, uh, we would say COVID-19 testing may be included as a standard workup among all CVT patients, including those who do not have any throat or respiratory symptoms. And uh, all COVID-19 positive patients with headache and neurological symptoms should be evaluated for CVT. And early diagnosis by MRI and MRV and rapid initiation of anticoagulation definitely will um, improve your outcomes. So that's my team. Um, that's our department of neuromedicine. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angel. I will clap on behalf of everybody who's listening. Super presentation. So please, people, post your questions or comments now. Um, we've had a question from Nick Wilcox, uh, who asks, do the great cerebral sinus endothelial cells express more ACE2 receptors than other endothelium, which I think he's getting at this question of why these particular, uh, you know, why these are, are, are sinus uh, brain thromboses rather than other parts of the body. What, what do you think about that, Angel? Or indeed, at this stage, I usually invite other guests to join, other speakers. Richard, if you want to join. Jim Sedgvar is, is with us today as well. So, um, but Angel, what are your thoughts on that? So, um, attempting to answer that question, I do not have an exact answer to that at the moment, but looking at the literature review, they say the neurotropism has actually contributed to a significant number of arterial and venous uh, thrombosis, especially in the cerebral circulation. So, all the cytopathic effects of the virus, which is, the, as I showed you in the initial part of the slide, where the pyroptosis, which is actually setting up the prothrombotic milieu, uh, happens at a higher rate in the CNS endothelium. Why is it because of the neurotropism the virus has? That has to be answered. Other than that, I do not have an answer. Let me just ask you, why don't you stop sharing your screen and, and turn your camera back on as well, and then we'll, then we'll be able to see yeah. you, which I think helps the discussion. I mean, but one thing that occurred to me, and we might hear more about this from, from Richard shortly, is certainly when we started uh, seeing the thromboses in the people who'd been vaccinated, it was felt that we were seeing it in the brain and in other um, venous systems, which are large, slow-flowing vessels. Um, and there was a feeling uh, that it might relate to the speed of flow, which is why you get thromboses in some places rather than in other, other, other veins. Um, but I don't know if Richard wants to jump in and make any comments on that or whether we should wait for his tour de force. Maybe uh, I'll ask an, an, another question, which was you, you mentioned, Angel, that um, fibrin, fibrinogen, D-dimer, and CRP all seem to relate to, was that prognosis of, of venous sinus thrombosis? Is that what you were saying? Yeah, so the studies have shown that higher the values, uh, in fact, uh, patients who, ten, who had actually died had very high values as opposed to those patients who survived. So, uh, so it can be used as a prognostic marker. So the higher the value, you might have to take it as a significant entry. Yeah. I just wondered, did you know, had anyone combined those different values so that um, the, uh, you know, to see if that gave a better predictor combining those different parameters, CRP, D-dimer and fibrinogen? Uh, I guess the latest study by the first slide, which I showed, the Taket et al., uh, looked, which looked at FILAC uh, cases of COVID-19 with 
CVT. In fact, they had a comparison group where they took patients who had received the mRNA COVID vaccine and those with influenza infection. And if I'm right, actually, they found again these three markers correlating to be higher in those with uh, COVID and CVT. So. Right, fabulous, yeah. Um, what uh, One other question was um, around, um, you, you talked about uh, the, you had your pathway for when to give heparin, etc. cetera. Um, what, what about if, if, if people have increased bleeding once you've started the heparin, what's your approach to that? Yeah, so I would talk about our experience uh, with CBT here. So we, we see large hemorrhagic infarcts, but we do not, once the CBT is proven, we do not hesitate to give the heparin. We've never noticed that causing an increased bleed. Not giving heparin will augment your venous congestion and the venous hypertension is the one which is fueling the bleed. So not giving heparin is more harmful than giving heparin. Sure, sure, great. Richard, I can see Richard's joined us now. Richard, do you have any, any comments on this aspect of, of thrombosis that we've seen in response to SARS-CoV-2? Um, yeah, thanks for the <clears throat> invitation to the comments. Um, so, uh, I mean, we, we have a problem, don't we, which is that uh, you, you demonstrated that your total numbers have not gone up all that much, and yet this is in the context of a massive um, spike in, in COVID-19 in the population, and it's always very, very difficult disentangling uh, um, the incidental uh, uh, coincidental occurrence of CBT versus something that's really causative um, and uh, I guess those D-dimers are helpful because the D-dimers aren't usually up in that range um, in most CVT patients so that's a kind of reassurance of something slightly different going on. Certainly the experience I know more really about arterial stroke in this setting um, and certainly in the UK uh, data on arterial stroke um, the, the relationship between arterial stroke and, and COVID wasn't quite as um, uh, tight as, as might have been thought initially with those early case reports. You know, we all heard about these very young patients with lots and lots of uh, inter intracranial arteries blocked. Um, and, and I was quite interested that in your data, patients tended to have other risk factors. And certainly with the COVID and arterial stroke literature, that was a theme that emerged rather strongly that this, uh, that the main effect, certainly at least in patients coming to stroke units rather than going on to ITU to find patients, that might be a different group. But in the patients that came to stroke units, it seemed as though COVID was much more um, uh, uh, combined with existing arterial risk factors, atrial fibrillation, carotid disease, etc., and producing a much worse stroke as a result. And I sort of got a little bit of a flavour of that from your talk, that there might be patients who have existing risk factors and the combination of a pre-existing risk and then the pro-coagulant state of COVID might, might, be, might be relevant. But it, it's very, very, it's always very, very difficult. This is a condition that crops up anyway. And, and, and so some of the patients are going to be people who have had CVT yeah. and happen to have had a recent COVID infection and, and disentangling that. Well, it's the same problem with the vaccine as you'll hear in a minute. Yes. All right, thanks. Thanks very much, Richard. Thanks, Angel. We have more questions, but we'll hold them and maybe come back to them for the general discussion at the end. We're going to let Richard go and prepare himself whilst we have the interlude. Bethany Facer is going to do the JNNP blog for us just to tell us what's been happening. So, Bethany, switch on and share your screen and let's hear what's been happening out there in the, uh, in the literature. Thanks. Thank you for um, inviting me to talk. Um, my name is Bethany Facer and I'm going to give a quick overview of some articles I found particularly interesting the past couple of months. I'm currently an analyst um, at the University of Liverpool with Dr Benedict Michael and I start my PhD in the last of the month. So the first paper I'm going to discuss is brain imaging before and after COVID-19 in the UK Biobank. Um, so this was a longitudinal multimodal MRI data from 785 participants from the UK Biobank, 401 of which tested positive, and they assessed before and after, so they could have a direct comparison. And they also looked at it in mild cases, and a lot of the literature has been looking at severe and moderate at the moment. Um, so they used two, two types of hypotheses to drive these to look at the different um, changes in neuroimaging. One was um, the hypothesis driven, which was looking at the olfactory and gustatory, and as well as exploratory approaches. 
and they identified 68 and 67 significant longitudinal effects associated with SARS COVID infection in the brain. And they also took some cognitive scores as well. So there's a few, there's a lot of findings of this, but some I'll discuss some of them. One, there was reduction in gray matter thickness and contrast in the lateral orbital frontal cortex and the parahippocampal gyrus after infection. The second, there was increased markers of tissue damage um, of the brain functionality connected to the peripheral cortex, anterior olfactory nucleus and olfactory tubercle. And interestingly, they also found that infected participants showed larger cognitive decline between the two time points. And this was also correlated with atrophy in the crust two of the cerebellum, which is the cognitive lobule. And this is a very interesting use of data, um, as we can directly see before and after. And it shows us that the spatial pattern of longitudinal abnormalities in limbic brain regions form, is formed a mainly olfactory network. So it is basically we're seeing atrophy, what the authors say, in the related to memory and the ol olfaction. And the authors suggest in vivo hallmarks of degenerative spread of the disease or the virus cell via olfactory pathways. Um, in the future, I do think it'd be interesting to look at more clinical correlates and also to look at the brainstem um, a little bit, little bit better, as you can see, because of spatial resolution. My next paper, which is now looking at neuropathological findings in post-mortem with patients who had had COVID-19 unfortunately died. And the aim of this is to find and quantify the presence of virus in selected areas showing pathological signs and areas of interest that might define a route of spread for the virus in the CNS. It says here. Um, so they investigated information alterations, and then from this, they looked at the presence of SARS-CoV-2. And from this, they found numerous, numerous changes, extensive. Um, they, found mainly, they found mainly changes in the olfactory bulb, um, but nowhere else. Um, and this was demonstrated in eight out of the 15 autopsies, just over 50%. But this is not par paralleled in any connecting areas of the olfactory pathway or elsewhere. And so because of this, the author suggests the absence of the virus in, as a virus in neural and glial compartments in adjacent areas could be related to common arterial supply as we're not seeing any direct infection, um, apart from the olfactory bulb. Um, my next paper, still on your, back to neuroimaging, is looking at metabolism in long COVID. Uh, so there was this study up there and then there was a follow on with a cohort of children as well. I mainly discussed the first study. So it was a retrospective analysis and it was 35 scans with long COVID versus 44 healthy controls. And there was also a child cohort as well. And the aim was to characterize cerebral hypermetabolism as well as cohort children with long COVID. And those with long COVID had had symptoms that persisted for longer than three weeks in the adult cohort. So patients with long COVID um, exhibited bilateral hypometabolism as well as this, these clusters were highly discriminant to distinguish patients in healthy subjects, which was obviously very interesting. And there were clusters of hypermetabolism associated with functional complaints and symptoms. The main areas where they find, found hypermetabolism was rather vast. It was the thalamus, the cerebellum, the orbital gyrus, and the brainstem. And the, the study demonstrates a profile of brain pet hypermetabolism in long COVID patients. And these hypertensions are also associated with patient symptoms, which could be valuable as a biomarker to potentially follow these patients. Interestingly, children found, found very similar hypermetabolism, but the, the patients were five months into long COVID and just warrants further investigation. My last article is on cognitive impairment in young COVID-19 patients, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, so at the moment, there's a lack of, lack of data on cognitive burden in SARS-CoV-2 infection um, in subjects who were previously independent and without a history of cognitive impairment before the infection, but then they've gone into hospital and have now a certain level of impairment. So the criteria for this was under 60 years old, no, no previous uh, diagnosis of any cognitive dysfunction and living independently prior to admission. Um, so all patients were screened using the MOCA, the Hamilton Depression and Hamilton Anxiety Scales. And there was 32 patients selected from 500 or met the criteria from 522 who entered the hospital in this time. No patients showed, showed anxiety and or depressive symptoms. But 13 of this, so 36%, 
were cognitively impaired and 19 unimpaired subjects. This is quite a significant unexpected rate of cognitive impairment in young subacute COVID-19 subjects at the time of hospital discharge. Interestingly, they did a follow up with 10 of the 19 unimpaired subjects using a battery of different cognitive tests, looking at different functions, and they found that eight of those 10 did have a pathological score, which suggests they had cognitive decline. So the results suggest a significant rate of cognitive impairment in the subacutes, but also on top of this it also suggests is the MOPA sensitive enough to be able to identify the, this, this, uh, this cognitive decline in a younger cohort. Uh, thank you very much for listening and thank you for giving me the opportunity. If you'd like to join the team, please send Tim a message. We'd be more than welcome to have you. Thank you very much. Bethany, thank you very much. I'll clap again on behalf of everybody. Uh, lots of food for thought there. Um, but we will move, as we always do, move straight on now to our uh, next speaker, which is uh, Richard Perry. Um, I trained, uh, Richard and I uh, both started our training in Oxford um, in the last century, sometime in the middle of it. And he's uh, now at University College London, where he's a neurologist uh, with special in, in, interest in stroke. And uh, he's going to tell us all about this fascinating complication of the vaccine. Richard, over to you. Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to share uh, some of this work that we've been doing together really over the last few months. Um, and you can see that, as well as Tom and myself, there's a large group of uh, collaborators uh, that are co-authors listed here, but also a very much larger group of um, collaborators. And it's a real tribute to neurology and, and stroke doctors in the UK that people have given up a lot of time to um, submit cases so that we can learn more about this condition uh, very quickly. So I'm going to be talking about the phenomenon of cerebral venous thrombosis occurring after vaccination against COVID-19. And this is a study that we've called Kayak, which is what we've been doing in the UK. Of course, my slides are going to freeze, which is going to be a challenge for me. So let's let me sort that out. So um, as many of you will know, because it's been covered a lot in the news, um, this uh, whole question arose really in uh, March um, when reports started coming out of this uh, nasty uh, venous thrombosis condition uh, occurring after specifically after adenovirus vector vaccine. So in the uh, UK, that's uh, largely AstraZeneca, as it is in a lot of places in Africa and um, so some of South America, um, uh, or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is largely in the in the USA. And um, this is a, a syndrome that's uh, now termed VIT. It has various other uh, names, TTS, VIPIT, um, but VIT seems to be gaining ground as the preferred terminology. Um, and uh, these are patients who um, nine or 10 days after they've received the vaccine uh, develop this uh, very severe uh, venous uh, thrombosis. And um, uh, it's interesting, we were talking earlier about why would uh, thrombosis have a predisposition for cerebral veins. C cerebral venous thrombosis is far and away the commonest manifestation of this condition, although we do see um, uh, thrombosis in other uh, organs, as, as, as I'll discuss in a minute. And within a few weeks uh, of this condition first being identified, the haematologists had been beavering away and had discovered that virtually all of the cases have this uh, specific antibody, antiplatelet 4, um, uh, antiplatelet factor 4 antibody, anti-PF4 antibody. Um, and we now believe, or they believe, that this is actually pathological in this condition, and it occurs in most cases. So we wanted to have a, a relatively simple design. We, we asked um, uh, our colleagues to submit um, any case of cerebral venous thrombosis that occurred uh, after vaccination, um, and we didn't limit our cases specifically to those with a low platelet count or high D-dimers, which are features of VIT, um, but we divided them into uh, the ones that we received into VIT and non-VIT cases. And VIT is a condition that's characterized uh, by a, a low platelet count. And we used the conventional uh, lower limits of normal of platelets of 150 and said, if, you, if you're lower than that, um, then you may have VIT. Um, and then if it was measured, which in 85% of cases it was, um, the D-dimer had to be greater than 2000. So uh, we'd probably have a more sophisticated definition now, but that was our, that was our starting definition for dividing into these two groups. 
received uh, 99, well, we've received more now, but at the time that we published this, we received 99 cases from 43 uh, UK hospitals, and we went through the case report forms very carefully, and 95 of those had good evidence for cerebral venous thrombosis. In, the most, in most cases, it's cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, but there were a few cortical vein thromboses in there as well. And of those, 70 uh, satisfied our very simple criteria for VIT, and 25 uh, had no evidence of VIT. And the basis of the way I'm going to be discussing this is an assumption that the ones that didn't have VIT are probably cerebral venous thrombosis that would that happened by chance uh, in in coincidence with the with the vaccine rather rather than being caused by it. You can see here what the features are of the uh, patients when they were admitted. Now, all of the patients are a bit older than you'd expect for cerebral venous thrombosis. Um, and that's because uh, in the UK, uh, the vaccination program was uh, started with the most elderly members of the population and then worked its way down. And at the time that the last case was submitted, um, only patients of 45 years and above had received the vaccine. So that's gonna shift um, all of the ages uh, uh, into a higher age range. But looking at the two groups, you can see that the patients with VIT uh, were a decade younger uh, on average with the median rather um, compared with those without VIT. So there does seem to be a predisposition for a slightly younger patient group, although the distribution of ages was very wide in both groups. And all of the patients who um, had VIT uh, this was after the first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine, whereas that was only true in 84% of the non-VIT cases. And uh, as was shown in previous studies, the vast majority of patients who had uh, VIT had anti-PF4 antibodies. The, the exceptions, I think, are not errors. Um, uh, we looked at them quite carefully, and there are patients who have very clear features of VIT, which I'll come on to a little bit more in a minute. Um, so convincing evidence of VIT, uh, but on repeated testing with sensitive tests, the ELISA test being the usual one, um, they were negative for anti-PF4 antibodies. So there is a group whose antibodies, if they're there, are not being detected by standard methods. You can see that uh, a couple of the non-VIT cases also had anti-PF4 antibodies. I think that's actually to do with our very simple definition of VIT, because when you went back to look at those cases, the ones that didn't satisfy our criteria but did have anti-PF4 antibodies, they had rather a lot of features of VIT. So I think this was probably a weakness of our starting definition. So the VIT patients were more unwell, and one of the manifestations of that is that they have, on average, more veins, more intracerebral veins thrombosed than the non-VIT cases do. Um, but the most striking difference, and Tom's already mentioned this, is that when we see patients with cerebral venous thrombosis, usually on the ward, um, they don't tend to have evidence of thrombosis elsewhere in the body. That's a fairly rare uh, phenomenon. Um, and uh, the one non-VIT case that had evidence elsewhere, again, was probably actually VIT when you look more carefully. Um, but when you look at the VIT group, um, uh, thrombosis in other veins uh, is really rather common. It's uh, uh, nearly 50% of, of those cases. And these other thromboses are in very odd places. Um, I mean, some of them are in, you know, they're the usual suspects, DVTs and PEs, but some of them are, uh, you know, quite a lot of them in the hepatic portal vein, it seems to be a, a particular site, um, superior mesenteric vein, the splenic vein, um, uh, so that, that there seems to be something about this clotting, this triangulopathy that uh, leads to a really rather unusual pattern of, of thrombosis in the body. So that was uh, the features at admission. Um, uh, at the end of the admission, we wanted to see how patients have done. And this uh, type of diagram will be very familiar to those of you who work in the world of stroke, uh, perhaps not so familiar to others. If you imagine that you've got 100 patients lined up with VIT and you've got 100 patients lined up who don't have VIT, the colours basically show in lightest blue the patients who had no symptoms at all at the end of their admission. The darkest blue shows the patients who died during their admission and then the intermediate blues are other levels of disability between those two and, and the MRS was mentioned a little earlier in, in, in uh, Angel's talk. So what you can see here is that the uh, proportion of patients who were free of symptoms at the end of admission uh, is uh, really uh, very small, less than 10% in, in the VIT group. 
compared with a much larger proportion in the non-VIC group. And the proportion of patients that die during the admission is very much higher. So the primary uh, um, uh, categorical distinction uh, for disability that we use was independence at the end of admission. How many patients were living independently at the end of admission? And in the VIC group, that was only just over half. And that's much lower than you would expect for cerebral venous thrombosis and much lower than was the case in the rather small non-VIC group that we had. And we also made comparisons with historical data and the non-VIC group are very similar to those that we would expect from historical data. So certainly the uh, degree of disability is, is, is higher in VIT um, and the proportion that died was 29% in the VIT group compared with only 4% in the non-VIC group, which again is 4% is roughly what we would expect for, for cerebral venous thrombosis. So this is a much more severe manifestation of cerebral venous thrombosis than we're used to seeing. We wanted to have a look at how patients did according to what treatment they were given. So you can see a few of the treatments listed along the bottom here. Um, heparins, largely given early on in our understanding of this condition non-heparin anticoagulants, intravenous immunoglobulin to try to dampen down the abnormal antibody, plasma exchange to try to get rid of the abnormal antibody, and platelet transfusions to try to overcome the very low platelet count that some of these patients have. And what you can see here are the proportion who were left alive and independent at the end of admission according to whether they were given the treatment in red or not given the treatment in blue. What you can see here is that for heparin, there's not very much difference whether they were given heparin or not uh, in terms of what their outcome was. Um, but the patients that were given non-heparin anticoagulants appeared to do very much better than the patients who were not. Um, and similarly, the patients who were given intravenous immunoglobulin uh, overall, the red bar there is much higher, 60%, than in the group who were not given intravenous immunoglobulin. So there's a little bit of support here for the idea that uh, non-heparin anticoagulation and intravenous immunoglobulin may be beneficial in this condition. On the other hand, the patients who received a platelet transfusion, only 16% of them achieved independence at the end of the admission compared with over 70% of patients who were not given platelets. There's a huge caveat to this type of analysis. These are not uh, patients who were randomized to receive or not receive the treatment. And so, of course, the, there could be uh, large inequalities between the two groups. And the platelet transfusions um, uh, example uh, illustrates that in that most of the patients who were given platelet transfusions, it was given to support uh, decompressive hemicraniectomy. And obviously, decompressive hemicraniectomy is something that you're only going to offer a patient if they have really quite significant, uh, significantly severe disease. So um, some of the association between giving platelet transfusions and a poor outcome is related to uh, the choice of patients for platelet transfusions. Um, but unfortunately, we're probably not ever going to have a randomized controlled trial for these, these treatments um, in these patients. So the best we can manage is to look at observational data uh, like this. So just to wrap up, um, uh, it's a very important question how we define these cases because we want to include patients who would benefit from these treatments, but they're very expensive treatments, they carry their own risks. So we want to exclude patients who don't have VIT from receiving those sorts of treatments. And the definition of VIT or VIT associated cerebral venous thrombosis in this case um, is therefore crucial in deciding who gets treatment and who doesn't. Um, and you can see here the first question was um, well um, is a platelet count of 150 which is shown in the dotted line here roughly the right place to put the threshold for dividing VIT from non-VIT and the evidence that we've got here um, is uh, most easily illustrated using anti-PF4 uh, status because, as mentioned earlier, anti-PF4 antibodies seem to be a reasonably specific marker for VIT. And I think uh, I could persuade you that most of the patients who are anti-PF4 uh, positive uh, are below the 150 threshold. In fact, you might even be tempted to put the threshold a bit lower, maybe 120. And uh, only one of those occurred just above the 150 threshold. No threshold is going to be perfect. Um, and then the vast majority of, of cases of, above that level of 158 in this case um, were anti-PF4 negative. So it looks as though 150 is a reasonable choice of threshold. Similarly, um, E-dimers appear to be a useful discriminator for determining whether this is incidental cerebral venous thrombosis that happens to have occurred after vaccination, or is this really VIT? 
Um, and I think I could persuade you that there's a bimodal distribution here. There's a group of patients who tend to be anti-PF4 negative in, in most cases and have a D-dimer of 2000 or less. And then there's another group, a completely separate group, who have um, very high D-dimers um, and certainly above uh, 2000. Some of the definitions that you'll see in the literature have tended to use a definition of 4000. And you can see uh, that uh, 4000 would not be as good a discriminator you'd be including a lot of your VIC patients in your non-VIC group if you used a D-dimer threshold of 4,000, at least, at least looking at our data. So in conclusion, um, cerebral venous thrombosis uh, in association with VIT is a very severe uh, condition with a very high mortality, um, nearly a third. Um, and uh, presumably that's at least in part because this is a coagulopathy which results in uh, more veins being thrombosed, uh, both within the head uh, and more dramatically than that, uh, anywhere else in the body. So there's a lot of uh, coagulopathy going all, uh, along and a lot, of, a lot of disability as a result. There's this observational data, which is a hint that non-heparin anticoagulation and intravenous immunoglobulin may correspond to a better outcome, although it's difficult to establish a causative relationship. Um, and on the whole, our data tend to support the uh, thresholds for uh, of it definition that we used uh, at the start. If you'd like to know more, um, then uh, uh, this is work that was published on the 6th of August in The Lancet. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Uh, let me applaud you on everyone's behalf. Um, lovely to see you presenting those data. I'm, I'm kind of having flashbacks to all those discussions we had about whether the cutoff should be 150 or not, whether D-dimer should be 2,000 or 4,000. But looking at the presentation today, I think in the end we, we got it about right. Do turn your um, camera on, if you will, if, you, if you're able. There we go. Fantastic. So good. We've got some questions coming in. So let's let's go to those questions. First of all, um, from uh, Glow uh, Wills, uh, the VIT group outcomes by treatment slide, how many were included in that analysis, that study? So they're very, they are very small numbers, um, and I'm not sure I can give you the exact numbers for every single treatment, but um, uh, overall, uh, those bars are going to add up to 70 VIT patients and 25 non-VIT patients. So the uh, bars where it was about 50-50 um, in the VIT group, they're going to be about 35 patients in each of those groups, and the bars where there was a sort of 70% bar and a 25% bar, that's going to be... Uh, uh, um, approximately 50 patients in the treated group. So yes, they're, they're small numbers. This is a rare condition. This occurs in, in, in one in 10,000 uh, cases. So um, the only way we're gonna get big numbers is uh, combining with international data sets. And we're, that's one of my major headaches at the moment is trying to get that sorted out. There's a large data set that hasn't yet quite come out from Jonathan Coutinho's group in Amsterdam. Um, there's obviously the CDC. I saw that we had somebody from the CDC on the call. Um, the CDC also got a lot of data. And so Jonathan's working very hard to try to make sure that we can give better data by combining much larger data sets. Yeah, we have Jim Savar on, on, on the call who, um, but I think he's in a different bit of the CDC. But anyway, we'll see if he wants to, to chip in. Um, and, but meanwhile, also just on that slide, so you drew attention to the um, IVIG and non-heparin anticoagulation, but um, as as being you know maybe useful. But uh, what about the platelets? You 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 didn't uh, draw attention to that. The platelets would seem to be harmful, or do you, or do you just think it's a reflection of a last ditch effort when the numbers are so low that people are giving platelets as a last ditch effort? So I think the actual data that we've got is probably the least useful because there is this strong correlation. And unfortunately, trying to tease out uh, using multivariate analysis, how much of this is a treatment effect and how much of it is patient selection is extremely difficult to do with without very much larger numbers. And the reason is that all of these treatments are correlated. The people that tended to get IVIG, tended to get steroids, tended to get uh, um, uh, then platelets, uh, um, plasma exchange, because often they would use both of those. So these correlations make it very difficult to sort out. However, I think there's a very strong theoretical reasons to think that platelets are actually harmful yeah. um, because when you've got a lot of anti-PF4 antibodies swilling around, um, uh, whatever the uh, 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 negative attractant is that, that, that binds to the anti-PF4, which we don't 
uh, to the PF4, which we don't quite know, and then attracts the antibody, you're probably yeah. driving that process by giving yeah. more platelets. So I think it's very difficult if you want to do a procedure, because it would be difficult to pers persuade a surgeon to go in if you've got a platelet count of 30 or 20, and, and those are standard yeah. platelet counts for these okay. patients. Right, we've got quite a few more questions, but let, I did see Jim. So Jim, tell us about the CDC, and then we've got another question for Angel, and we'll we'll keep it floating like that. Jim, uh, you're on mute at the moment, Jim. Sorry. Uh, right, right. I just I want to keep it moving, but I, because I missed the last very last part of his question. Uh, so, so Jim, I think the, the question was about the data, whether you know anything about. There's a large the CDC are doing a collection of patients like this, and I think the question was, do you know where where the CDC are up to with that in terms yeah, of maybe I, I, publishing? I, 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 I do not at this point. So, I, so in the interest of time, I want to keep it moving. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jim. Good to see you. Anyway, lovely to see you. It is good to see everybody. So, Great. Still um, getting my still getting my feedback. So. Yep. Yep. Good. Uh, now, Angel, uh, there was a qu uh, question for you on um, uh, DOAX. Have DOAX been studied in this setting? Is there a role for prophylactic DOAX in those with severe SARS-CoV-2? And how useful are scores such as the HASBLED in estimating the risk of bleeding in this population? Um, so, uh, regarding uh, in the emergent management, there is no role for DOAX. There is no evidence. So the best evidence exists for low molecular weight heparin versus uh, unfractionated heparin if you have contraindications for low molecular weight heparin. Uh, answering the second question, um, has blood score. So, um, as I already said, in CVT, the pathogenesis seems to be venous hypertension, which is causing the bleed. So this score might not be relevant to assess the bleeding risk in this context. So despite the extent of bleed, we should go ahead and anticoagulate the patient. Great. All right, we've got a, f a fabulous, um, we're going to go quick question, quick answer, see if we can get through these last few in the last two minutes. So uh, for Richard, um, why, does anyone have any idea, or indeed for anyone, does anyone have any idea why it's the adeno vaccines which are predisposing to this particular problem compared with the mRNA vaccines, Richard? So I'm happy to uh, hear more expert answers to that. I, I don't think we understand what component of the, vac of the vaccine is responsible for this. It doesn't seem to be the spike protein. And it seems that the mechanisms here are completely different to the coagulopathy that we see in COVID-19. Yeah. Um, uh, but whether it's a component of the virus itself or whether it's some uh, element of how the antigen is processed when cells are exposed to it, I think even that, which we think is the first question, I'm afraid it, we don't yet have an answer. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. I'll just add, it does not happen with aden other adeno-based vaccines particularly. So it's not just the vector and it's clearly not just the spike. It's perhaps some combination or the way the spike is being processed through cells. And uh, yes or no, any sign of HLA associations? Oh, we didn't have that data. No, I, I don't know of any at all. Jim, I don't know if you've heard of anything around that. Um, no, okay. Let's go to this question uh, from, um, sorry, and I usually say the question's from, but we, we don't have time today, sorry. Uh, for I, Angel, did you notice any prominent age incidents in the CVT COVID-related patients? Uh, we're not seeing a very starting difference between the uh, non COVID CVT and us, but uh, what we're seeing is they're generally tending to be the younger age, like the second and third decade. The lowest age group in our cohort was 19, and the highest was around 47. So that's what we're looking at. Okay, fabulous. I'm going to stop on time because um, I want to, and we should because we're moving on to the WHO Clinical Exchange. But I would say um, it's fabulous to have so many questions and sorry we did not manage to answer them all. The speakers can can read them online and then can post answers online because uh, we, we, we stay on these same channels, but we're just going to now slip across to the WHO Clinical Exchange. And so um, let me uh, thank Richard Angel, uh, and Bethany uh, for their talks today. And at this point, we'll hand over from, to my friend Tamari Piri in Malawi. Tamari, over to you.